Hello and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Drug Target Review and Eurofins Discover X, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'm your moderator, Ellen Capon, Editorial Assistant at Drug Target Review. Today's speaker will be Dr. Jennifer Lynn Jones, Associate Director of the Assay Development Research and Development Department at Eurofins Discover X. Following their presentation, we will move on to a live question and answer session where you can post questions to Dr. Lynn Jones. Please remember you can submit questions at any point during the webinar using the questions panel situated in the menu on the right. So without hesitation, may I pass over to Dr. Lynn Jones. Welcome to this webinar on cell-based assays for advancing therapeutics targeting cytokines and the receptors. My name is Jennifer Lynn Jones and I am Associate Director of Cell-Based Assay Development at Eurofins DiscoverX Products Division, located in Fremont, California, the Bay Area. Cytokines are essential proteins that exert potent control over entire cell populations to fight infections and other pathologies, but by themselves can also cause disease. Therefore, cytokine-related drugs act either by stimulating or blocking cytokine signaling pathways. Antigen presentation by dendritic cells to naive T cells, along with other factors listed in the slide, induce these T cells to produce interleukins and, different, and differentiate into various helper T cell populations. These T cell subsets can promote different types of immune and inflammatory responses based on their own cytokine production, responses to chemokines, and interactions with other cells. Cytokines involved in inflammation are highlighted in boxes. And examples of approved drugs targeting these specific inflammatory cytokines are shown on the right. This slide illustrates the importance of therapeutics targeting cytokine signaling. Three of the top selling drugs in 2023 target cytokines are the receptors. Humira, which targets TNF-alpha signaling, Dupixin, which targets IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, and Stellara, targeting IL-23, IL-12 signaling. Two of these therapeutics are also among a list of cytokines currently under development for biosimilars. So adalimumab and ustikinab, um, again, targeting TNF-alpha and the IL-12, IL-23 uh, signaling pathways. But this slide also illustrates that there are many other therapeutics uh, that are undergoing biosimilar development uh, for other cytokine uh, targets. Cytokines such as interleukins and interferons are secreted proteins that carry intra and intercellular signals that regulate the immune response. To initiate signaling, cytokines must bind to specific extracellular receptors. Some cytokines such as type 1 interferons have dedicated receptor chains. However, other cytokines bind to both specific and shared receptors. For the IL-2 family of cytokines, a common receptor subunit, the gamma-C, also called IL-2-RG, shown in purple, heterodimerizes or trimerizes to bind specific cytokines, while for the IL-10 family of cytokines, different combination of receptor pairs determine cytokine specificity. Diversity of cytokine signaling is created by these different receptor combinations, as well as the makeup of the different cytokines. Cytokines themselves can consist of homodimers like IL-2 and IL-4, shown on the left, or form heterodimers as well. In the example shown on the right, IL-12 and IL-23, the two cytokines share a common subunit, P40, but heterodimerization with unique second receptor receptors uh, determines the downstream sig signaling, which can involve different downstream elements, such as kinases, JAKs shown here, and transcription factors, STAT3 shown in this signaling cascade. Here at Eurofins DiscoverX, we engineer a wide array of cell-based assays designed to measure signaling from various targets. But for today's webinar, the focus will be those for the therapeutics affecting cytokine signaling. Almost all DiscoverX 
DiscoverX assays employ our proprietary enzyme fragment complementation, or EFC technology, which is based on the split beta-galactosidase enzyme. Beta-gal is split into two fragments, the smaller enzyme donor, or ED, and the larger enzyme acceptor, or EA, uh, fragment, which makes up the bulk of the enzyme. These two fragments can be fused to proteins. When separated, the two fragments have no enzyme activity, but when brought into proximity, a complementation occurs, resulting in an active enzyme whose activity is detected by substrate addition with cell lysis that emits luminescence. Some of the features of our EFC assays are listed here, but for the sake of time, I will not go through these in details, except to say that these assays are easy to run. There are no media changes, washing steps, and they're very fast. And the results are robust and reproducible, and our assays are supported for easy transfer to test facilities. The two assay formats relevant to cytokine signaling that I will highlight today are our dimerization and reporter assays. So the schematic here uses IL-23 IL induced dimerization to illustrate how the assay works. The two receptor subunits activated by the IL-23 header dimer are each tagged with uh, the complementary enzyme fragments. When IL-23 binds, the receptors dimerize, complementation occurs, and the beta-gal enzyme becomes active to give a luminescent signal. Shown on the right are only a few of the many other examples of cytokine dimerization assays with signal to background ratios greater than six and sensitive responses, cytokine EC50s in the sub to single nanogram per mil range. The targets shown are all for cytokines relevant to inflammation. The second type of assay that measures cytokine signaling activation uses a reported gene that is tagged with a small enzyme donor, the small enzyme donor fragment, also called enhanced prolabel or uh, shortened to EPL here. Activation of the receptor complex by a cytokine initiates a series of signaling events that eventually results in transcription factor activation of a promoter driving expression of the tagged reporter. Activation is measured by the addition of enzyme substrate in the complementary enzyme fragment with cell lysis to quantify the amount of receptor protein generated. Examples of signaling reporter assay results for many of the same cytokines shown on the previous slide are presented here and show much larger signal to background ratios, greater than 14 and as high as 28, and as well as low EC50 50s ranging from sub to tens of nanogram per mil range in, the, in this range. Here is a comparison of results measuring TSLP signaling using both our dimerization and signaling reporter assay. First, some differences in the engineering of the assays. Most of our dimerization assays use tagged receptors that are often truncated um, with the consisting of the extracellular and transmembrane domains um, and, and tagged with the, either the ED or EA uh, enzyme fragments. Whereas signaling reporter cells require a functional full-length reporter that is either endogenously expressed or expressed from a transgene in order to activate the downstream reporter. In the case of the TSLP uh, reporter assay, only one of the re re receptors was engineered into the cells to obtain signal from the STAT5 reporter used for this assay. Notice that the signal to background ratios are very similar in both assays, but the, the dimerization exhibits greater sensitivity with a greater than tenfold lower EC50 for TSLP. Now in this second example, uh, of, of the uh, with results from the two assay formats with IL-15 assays, IL-15 or an IL-15 fusion to the IL-15RA subunit was used for testing. In both sets of assays, the receptors were expressed from transgenes, uh, truncated in the case for the dimer and full length for the reporter. But in this case, the signal to background ratio is much greater with the reporter and showed greater sensitivity, especially for IL-15. While not always the case, reporter gene assays can often yield larger windows than the dimerization assays.
So while both dimer and reporter assays can be used for measuring signaling pathways, dimer assays are much more specific in their cytokine activation than reporters because of the receptor pairs used in the assay. In this example uh, with a dimer assay, the ILR1, IL1 RAP uh, dimer uh, pair, um, six cytokines were tested, but the IL1, IL ILR1, IL1 RAP dimerization is observed only with IL1 beta. Reporter genes, in contrast, contain transcri transcriptional response elements, NF kappa B in the case shown here, that can be activated by any number of different signaling pathways, including not only IL1 beta, as shown here, but also TNF alpha and other ligands. This response to the, in the reporter assay is dictated by what receptors are, and signaling components are expressed in the cell background used to make the assay. So to, to, to demonstrate the specificity of the dimerization, uh, I use this IL-23 and IL-12 uh, dimerization assays uh, as an example. Both these cytokines are validated uh, therapeutic targets for Crohn's disease, plaque psoriasis, and arthritis. Dimerization activation is very specific for discrete cytokine and receptor subunit combinations. IL-12 and 23 signaling involve common cytokine, P40 in this case, and receptor IL-12-RB1 subunits. It is the specific cytokine subunits, P35 and P19 shown here, and receptor partners IL-12-RB2 and IL-23-R, which endow the cytokine receptor dimer specificity of signaling pathway activation. When both IL-12, IL-23, and a homodimer of the P40 subunit are used to test the two different dimer assays, IL-12 activates IL-12 dimerization, but not IL-23-R, IL-12-RB1 dimerization. And the case is similar, uh, is, is vice versa for IL-23 with the two assays, with IL-23 activating IL-23 receptor dimerization, but not IL-12 receptor dimerization. The P40 subunit, uh, 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 dimeric subunit, results in equally poor activation in both assays. The specificity of the dimerization is further demonstrated with a therapeutic antibody, ustekinab, targeting the common P40 subunit found in IL-12 and IL-23, which inhibits both IL-12R and IL-23R dimerization, uh, shown as blue curves in, in the two graphs. However, the therapeutic antibodies for uh, the P90 subunit specific for IL-23 only inhibits uh, IL-23 signaling in the IL-23R dimerization assay and has no effect on IL-12 activation of IL-12 receptor dimerization shown on the left. The data with the three therapeutic antibodies in the IL-23R dimerization assay also demonstrates how these assays can be used to rank order and compare the activity and potency of different drugs. Another example I would like to present that de demonstrates the greater specificity of the dimer assay over the reporter assay is for IL-4, IL-13 signaling. There are two different IL-4R complexes that are both activated by IL-4. There's the type 1 IL-4R, which consists of the IL-4R in combination with the IL-2RG uh, receptor um, labeled as gamma-C in the diagram. And these types of receptors are, are predominantly expressed in immune cells and bind only to IL-4. The type 2 IL-4R uh, complex consists of IL-4R in combination with the IL-13R alpha receptor partner. And these types of receptors are expressed in epithelial cells and can bind both IL-4 and IL-13. The signaling reporter assay, the results shown on, in the graph, measures signaling from both IL-13 and IL-4, but the two receptor complexes that respond to IL-4 have the same downstream signaling cascade to activate the reporter and the therefore cannot distinguish effects from type 1 and type 2 receptor signaling. Any IL-4 me measured will be the sum total from the activation of both complexes. 
This contrasts um, the testing with the IL-4 are dimerization assays specific for the two complexes. And we know that the signaling reporter assay uses both uh, type 1 and type 2 IL-4 R complexes because we stained the, the cell line uh, for IL-2 RG expression by flow cytometry and see that IL-2 RG uh, expression is uh, endogenously expressed in, in the reporter cell line. Therefore, any signaling from uh, with IL-4 in the, re in the reporter um, cell line is uh, the sum total from both type 1 and type 2 receptor complexes. The two dimer assays responsive to IL-4 can measure signaling from either the type 1 or the type 2 receptor complexes and not both. As would be predicted, the IL-4R, IL-2RG dimer assay responds only to IL-4 and not IL-13, while the IL-4R and IL-13R dimer assay measures signaling of both IL-4 and IL-13 from the type 2 IL-4R complex. So using both IL-4R dimers to characterize therapeutics that affect either type 1 or type 2 receptors might be beneficial for IL-4 immunotherapy, but with reduced side effects. Testing with dupilumab, an antibody which targets the IL-4 receptor, blocks both IL-4 and IL-13 activation in, in both assays, in both assay formats. But again, only by using the two IL-4R dimer assays with different, dimer, diff, different partners can it be confirmed that dupilumab is blocking both type 1 and type 2 IL-4R complex signaling. In the case of IL-4 and dupilumab in, with the uh, reporter assay, presumably dupilumab is inhibiting both type 1 and type 2 receptors uh, activated by IL-4. Finally, one other example of another dimerization for IL-17, which is activated by both IL-17A and IL-17F. IL-17A and IL-17F exhibit different efficacies and sensitivities and can be used to assess the effects of secucanab, a therapeutic for IL-17A when used with IL-17A, shown here. In addition, the testing of this drug and gosulcumab in the IL-23R and IL-12RB1 dimerization assay using IL-23 can maintain the responses uh, with a, a number of EC50s. They can maintain their robust responses and sensitivity to cytokine and drug in the presence of normal human serum. This is important for uh, using these assays for screening of drug neutralizing antibodies in patient serum. So in this slide, we show how the IL-17R dimerization assay can be used to detect a neutralizing antibody to secucanab using the PathHunter IL-17RARC dimerization assay. Increasing concentrations of an anti secucanab antibody can block inhibition of IL-17A signaling by two different concentrations of secucanab. The effective neutralizing concentration, uh, or NC50, is in the 10 to 100 nanogram per mil range, meeting the FDA guideline of a minimum sensitivity of one microgram per mil. All testing was performed in the presence of 10% human serum. So in conclusion, the dimerization assay, sh assay shown here shows good functionality, even in the presence of 10% human serum, making them appropriate for screening the presence of drug neutralizing antibodies in human serum, as is shown in this example here. In contrast, some of our cytokine signaling reporter assays we've tested appear to be sensitive to human serum in the assays. And this data is shown in this slide here. In this set of data, uh, using an NF-kappa B reporter cell line to measure IL-1 beta activation and inhibition of this activation with an uh, IL-1 beta antibody, the agonists and antagonists were compared in the presence or absence of 5% normal human serum. The signal-to-background ratios are sig significantly attenuated when used in the presence of 5% human serum. 
especially during antagonist testing. From, for comparison, the dimerization to measure IL-1 beta act, uh, activation does not show much difference in either cytokine activation or inhibition of activation within IL-1 beta antibody or performed with or without 10% human serum. Again, these results suggest that dimerization assays are better suited for NAB screening, and one might speculate that something in human serum is affecting other uh, signaling pathways uh, that read out in the NF-kappa-B reporter. Finally, in this portion of my presentation, I would like to address the application of these cytokine assays for relative potency, characterization, and lot release application. These assays are developed for use in bioassay or ready-to-use formats and have been qualified for their ability to meet the criteria needed for assay qualification of therapeutics. Some of the properties that are listed here, that the assays reflect MOA for the drug, can measure changes in drug potency, and are optimized to give robust and reproducible results. We can also provide long-term quality material and support for testing drugs during development as well as in the production phase. So this is an added plus that these assays are well qualified. The results here demonstrate the ability to measure a wide range of potencies with a relative potency analysis of Actemra using IL-6 bioassay cells measuring IL-6-induced IL-6R, IL-6ST dimerization and inhibition by tocilizumab. This, this analysis was performed by two uh, analysts and shows that the, the, quali the, the, the results are highly reproducible. These results, along with the additional testing criteria, multiple experiments, multiple plates, are summarized here and demonstrate the accuracy, precision, and dilutional linearity with Actemra in the tocilizumab bioassay. So in this webinar, I have presented data from only a subset of the many cell-based assays focused on cytokine signaling. In some cases, we have more than one format for interrogating signaling for a specific cytokine. Our menu of assays has an approximately 80% coverage of all interleukins and continues to grow. Our custom development team is also a bit available for development of cell-based assays in a format most appropriate for your needs to help bring your therapeutic to market. So in summary, urofin cytokine receptor assays are available in multiple formats to measure receptor activ activation dimerization, as well as other steps in cytokine signaling. Um, many of those uh, assay formats I have not uh, shown here. These formats include stable cell lines, research grade express assay kits, and ready to use bioassay kits that can be used at various stages encompass encompassing discovery through development and into commercial release and stability QC lot testing. The two formats that were featured in this webinar were the the path hunter dimerization and the signaling reporter assays for cytokines. Evidence for the specificity for the dimerization assays was presented and their suitability for NAB testing due to their insensitivity in the presence of human serum. Reporter assays are also offered as an alternative for measuring changes in cytokine signaling and can often provide larger assay windows and sometimes greater sensitivity for screening. Both assay formats have been used to develop bioassay kits that are suitable for relative potency testing. I would also encourage you to contact our custom development team for additional assay needs, including new targets, MOAs, or drug characterization. The link for custom projects can be found on the web link page listed on the slide shown in this link here. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Lynn Jones, for your excellent presentation. There should now be a link from Eurofin's Discover X about cytokine receptor product solutions posted in the chat. Please feel free to look over this.
We will now have the pleasure to introduce our question and answer session where Dr Lynn Jones will answer all of your questions. Don't forget you can still submit your questions using the questions panel in the menu on the right. So let's take a look at the first question. How would you rate the overall performance of the assay? So uh, I just um, sent out a chat message to the questioner to ask um, what uh, what which receptor he's uh, he or she is specifically referring to? Um, I mean, both uh, both assays are excellent. I mean, they both uh, have you know excellent responses to cytokines and um, have been used in in various formats as I've discussed in the webinar. So, thank you. Given that you have different MOAs captured through different pathways for your cytokine assays, what should the user keep in mind before selecting one? I think um, this is, you know, uh, a very critical decision for any uh, person who would be interested in testing their their drugs or their um, molecules uh, with these assays to decide between the two formats because both the dimerization and the reporter assay formats, um, while they both represent the true mechanism of action for their cytokine receptor activation, they record um, very different events in the signaling pathway. In the case of the dimerization assay, it's a it's a very early event, and that provides a lot of specificity as to uh, you know how how your drug is affecting um, uh, cytokine receptor activation. Whereas the signaling uh, reporter assay is is much further downstream in the signaling cascade, and therefore can be affected by uh, other signaling pathways. So ideally, um, evaluating both MOAs for your drug may provide a more comprehensive characterization of your therapeutic, but practically this, this may not be possible. So I mean, it may be, may be that um, an evaluation of both formats is required um, uh, it's in order to uh, evaluate which performs better and also to give a thorough understanding and multiple points of reference for the drug's potency. Generally, um, the reporter signaling assay, um, typically, as I mentioned in the webinar, gives a higher to signal to background ratio, but this is highly target dependent. So uh, depending on which target uh, is of interest, um, you may just wanna compare the performance of both assays. Um, but again, the dimerization format could offer a more stoichiometric uh, understanding of the drug's potencies. So again, the decision of which assay to use will depend on the target and user preferences and probably need to be analyzed accordingly. Uh, nevertheless, either assay could be used for um, a lot release uh, at the lot release stage as both uh, assays represent the true MOA for the cytokine biological activity. Does the human serum inhibit the performance of the cytokine receptor assay? You mentioned it being insensitive in the pre presence of human serum. So um, all our assays are, well, uh, the different assays will have different amounts of serum in the assay. Um, and, uh, but, uh, um, but yes, that, so so the performance that you see in, in many of the graphs is uh, with varying amounts from one percent to to ten percent uh, serum, and then and as as we showed in the during the webinar, the in the case of uh, the presence of uh, normal human serum, um, the, the dimerization assays seem to be more tolerant of uh, have less effects seen with uh, in the presence of human serum. Uh, please could you show us once again the slide about the diversity of interleukins receptor family? Uh, do we have the ability I do to... Your present... Jennifer, I have your presentation. Do you know which slide that might be on and I'll pull it up? Okay, let me let me look. Um, it is slide five, I think, okay. is the one. Great, one moment. In the meantime, what is your high level estimate of timeline for customized dimerization assay development? So um, I think, yeah, I mean, so for customized, again, it, it depends on the 
complexity. I mean, the dimerization assays can be a little bit complex, um, so but roughly around six months from the time uh, from the initial cloning of the receptors constructs to the to generating passage uh, stability data for the final clone. Are your cytokine assays used for potency or NAB testing in a quality control environment, or are there any BLA filings that could be referred? Let's see. Um, y yes, uh, they um, yes, they're they are designed as an easy uh, to use means of measuring drug potency and neutralizing antibodies um, in patient serum in, in QC environments. And, and as I showed, the, the dimers are especially uh, uh, suited to this because of their tolerance to, to normal human serum, the presence of normal human serum. One key example is our PathHunter U2S IL-23R IL-12RB1 dimerization assay, which has been used for potency testing of a first-in-class IL-23 P19 subunit inhibitor biological therapy, or TRMPHIA, from Janssen, as noted in the BLA filing. What is your high-level estimate of timeline for customized dimerization assay development? Um, I think I just answered that in the previous one. Sorry. Uh, but I, I think the short answer was around six months, and that's a very, you know, give or take. How passage stable are your cell lines? Have you tested for it? And do you observe any loss of receptor expression at higher passage numbers? Yes, so all of our assays um, that we re release to market um, are tested for at least 10 to 15 passages for both functionality and um, that the, the receptor expression is maintained in the cell line. Um, but since uh, uh, but since we typically use viral transduction for assay development, which stably integrates the expression cassette into the host cell genome, we find most cell lines maintain receptor expression and assay functionality. So most clones are that we develop are stable. Um, for cell lines that will be used to develop bioassay lots, the lines are tested for stability through 30 passages, and some assays have been confirmed to be stable for uh, 40 passages and beyond. Does Eurofins offer any reported gene assays for measuring mouse cytokine signaling in rodent cells? Um, again, this would be addressed to our custom assay team. I mean, we do um, generate uh, orthologue uh, assays for, for many, both the dimer and the reporter assays. And um, we have a lot of experience working with many different cell backgrounds. So uh, that would definitely be something that we could do. Could these assays be transferred to a CRO site for screening? Are there any limitations? Yes, um, assays can be transferred to a CRO site for all sorts of uh, therapeutic development, such as screening, characterization, or potency, and NAB testing. Our uh, field application scientists team routinely provides assay transfer support and expertise across different geographies. Um, there's minimal paperwork to sign with a one-time transfer fee for, any, for tra assay transfers to CROs. Do you provide these assays as a service for proof of concept type studies where different formats could be compared? Yes, we, uh, we do, and we do this um, quite routinely. We have a custom assay development. This is also part of our custom assay development team um, that they can generate data to show feasibility. Um, such data would, could consist of comparing a client molecule in different assay formats or optimization of assay workflows, and we can help transfer the assay to the receiving site quite efficiently. Please join me in thanking Dr. Lynn Jones. As you leave the webinar today, a survey will appear on your screen asking you to rate the webinar. Please take a moment to provide your feedback. If now is not a good time, the survey will be sent to you shortly via email. If you could complete it when you can, we would greatly appreciate it. On behalf of Drug Target Review and Eurofins Discover X, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.